everybody. Welcome to another week of science. This is This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the things that we thought we would bring to the program today. And as you all know, this is the uh, broadcast of our podcast. So some of the things in the next hour or so may be edited out for the podcast version. So what you're Raw watching is... Raw live version. Raw live version. So, um, but it's going to be interesting because Justin's going to be very quiet today in yes. VR voicing because his baby's still sleeping. So don't wake the baby, Justin. I'll try not to. I really, try, I'm very actually afraid that I will forget. Try not to get too excited child, about concrete. Yes. My child is sleeping and say something <laughs> loud and then there'll be this shrill. <laughs> like, oh, Daddy, what have you done? It. done? done it. Why don't you? Be with me right now. <sighs> All right, everyone. We are going to do this science show, and we'll be with you for the next couple of hours talking science. We're glad you are here with us. So, uh, I guess as we get started, make sure you click those likes and those bells and all the things, and make sure that the algorithms love us. So, let's start the show. Oh, wait, that's Blair, not me. Hey, you want to do it? Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I click a button, it turns into Blair, we do a thing. It's all good. Yeah, that's just the way it's going to work. All right, let us begin. Like Caesar, like Romaine. In a three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 909, recorded on Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Laser-guided lightning, very, very frightening. I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we'll fill your head with lightning nonsense and snot bubbles, but first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program is all about science. Not about all science, that would take too long to listen to. This is just a slice of recent science. A peek into the ongoing efforts within research to reassure you that sane work is being done somewhere in the world. And to get your mind thinking, not that it wasn't already, about what a truly wonderful mystery we are surrounded by, with all the things we know already, with all the discoveries and inventions that have come before, new knowledge has a certain excitement about it. It can feel almost inevitable at times when a new technology or therapy is unveiled. But there is, along the way, incremental advances. Simple mechanisms understood, previously missed observations noted, concise experimentation conducted. And through it all, the step-by-step, data-point-by-data-point gathering of knowledge builds upon our previous understanding to make the mysterious mundane. The mundane, manageable, and the previously unimaginable as routine as a self-driving electric car or a novel virus rapid home test. Or another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We're back again to talk about all the science that we wanted to talk about this week, and we think that you will enjoy as well. Ah, don't wake the baby. Okay, we have a whole, <laughs> whole bunch of science coming your way. Thank you for joining us for the show today. On the show tonight, I have stories about aging mice, solar flares, and vagrant birds. What? Yeah, Justin, what'd you bring? I've got laser-guided lightning, self-healing Romans, ancient Norwegian nonsense, and an anti-metastic peptide fantastic story. 
Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Want to hear about that one? Right. Bla- yeah. oh, <laughs> <laughs> Blair, what's in the animal corner? <laughs> Oh, I have the snot bubbles that you mentioned earlier. Very excited to talk about that. Also, I have some dogs and toddlers. Always fun in a room together. And then intentional invasives. How's that for an oxymoron? Yes. Hmm. Like humans. I want to go there. You're right. Invited? Invited? Are they invited? It's a whole thing. We're going to talk about it. Yeah. (laughs) Can't (laughs) wait. I'm looking forward to it. All right. As we jump into the show, for those of you who know, you already know, but those of you who don't, if you have not subscribed yet to our podcast, we have podcasts. You can find us all places podcasts are found. We also stream weekly Wednesday nights, 8 o'clock p.m. Pacific time on YouTube, Twitch, and Facebook. We and are... then again, and then again, we do the same thing at 5 a.m. Central no, it, European time. It's all at the same time. It's time zones, yeah. Justin. Just the same thing if people are up that early. Yeah. Book. Um, oh, but you can find us on Twitter and Mastodon and Instagram and Twitch as Twist Science, T-W-I-S-C-I-E-N-C-E. If all of this is just so much, head to twist.org. That's our website. Show notes, links, all that kind of stuff is found there. Time for the science? Yes. Let's do it. Okay, let's make this show happen. Scientists want to predict the future. Of course they do. Of course they do. Uh, Researchers, uh, NASA researchers, have been working recently using NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory to take a look at various layers of the sun's atmosphere to determine the dynamics of the... uh, photosphere, the chromosphere, the corona, all of these various layers that may give some kind of information about what kind of energy the sun is going to just impart on us. Solar weather, it affects us. From those solar flares that are just energetic and impact our magnetosphere to the ones that are really, really mag- like energetic and can actually impact our, our satellites and all of the electrical systems on our planet, overloading capacitors. I mean, things could happen and we want to be ready. We want to know what's happening in terms of the sun's activity. Solar flares, we know, are a big part of this. And so how could little flashes on the sun be like a little match that starts the fire, that becomes an eventual flare that will impact us? And so the researchers have been taking a look. They just published in the Astrophysical Journal their information from the corona that's different from the photosphere, which is the surface of the sun. And they've uh, discovered a marker, actually, that allows them to determine which areas are going to flare sooner rather than later, which areas are going to stay quiet and which ones are not. So this particular paper, and there's another paper that's published as well that has uh, publicly available data data from the SDO, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, has been taking a look at images of these active active regions in ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet light. So stuff that's not in the human visible spectrum. I mean, ultraviolet light, you can maybe take a look at just at sunset, right? But Ultraviolet light, extreme ultraviolet light, these are things that are outside of our visible spectrum, but they are energetic spectrums, and we can look at them with various instruments. And so they've been able to take a look at eight years of images of these active regions, and based on statistical methods that are developed by a team member named Graham Barnes, they have determined that there are little tiny flashes in the corona precede the actual flares. And so it's kind of like trying to figure out when a volcano is going to erupt here on Earth. What are the little signals or the little shakes that will allow us to have a little bit of warning before a flare happens? So 
if this is if the, if once we see a blast going off, I'm trying to figure out my 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 brain is trying to wrap around this. It takes eight Time. minutes, yeah, for that light that the for the light to travel. I don't know how long a solar flare takes to reach. Probably not far behind that eight minutes. Mm -hmm. However, if we're doing an observation, we need the light to have traveled for eight minutes. <laughs> so. Aren't we finding out that it's happening as it's happening? No, because we don't have FTL communication with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So it's all time shifted. But because we're seeing the flare before, I mean, be, the little flash of light. The flash. There's a little tiny yeah. flash of light, right? We see a flash. We go, oh, we're going to be ready for this. And if it's something that's pointed at us, we can potentially take action because we'll have maybe a little longer than eight minutes to but be ready. But that flash happened eight minutes ago on the sun. Right, but <laughs> my... the flare so now... comes after the flash. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Okay, I got we it. have time. Okay. Yeah. It's, so, so if it's, it's a warning it's also, system. If, it's, if it is, uh, if it takes a while to develop, we would have time. Like maybe we're like, oh, it's this is developing, but it takes you know a month or something. Uh, then we go, well, maybe the Earth will be pointed somewhere else or somewhere else or slightly around the sun. Yeah. Or so, if it's a 12 hour, it's like, <laughs> ah, it'll hit the other side of the world. We'll be fine. That's really the question is yeah. what is, what is the, the, the general range of, of warning that we would get from this? Yeah. Well, it's better than volcanoes currently, so which is <laughs> maybe thirty seconds. It um, still seems like it's not enough time to shield all of our electronics. Like we should probably do that hardening first, regardless. <laughs> absolutely, but there's not a lot that we can do about our satellites. I mean, is eight minutes mm. enough time to signal to our satellites to power down for a period of time? Is the, you know, is the, the flare going to be the kind of flare that's so powerful that it just burns out electrical components in satellites, regardless of whether yeah. they're turned on or not? You know, there's, there's a lot right. that still needs to be determined, but this is the beginning of developing that early warning system that will allow us to be able to make potential changes down here on Earth. Uh, but yeah, you're exactly right. We need to strengthen our electrical transport systems, our infrastructure here anyway. There's a lot that we just need to be doing differently. Um, but yeah. So basically, know. we figured out there's a precursor. Yes. Now is the time to collect just heaps and heaps and heaps of data to figure yeah. out what kind of precursor on average it is to then be able to toy with things that we can do to, okay, got it. Yeah. <laughs> right, I also I'm appreciate board. that these researchers did not take the advice they were given as children and have been staring at the sun. I yes, mean, you got you it. Much. Yeah, they, they do it so we don't have to. <laughs> thank you very exactly. much for ruining your vision. But laser beams, that's another thing you're not supposed to look at. What have you been staring at, <laughs> I Justin? Never, never stared at a laser beam. So yeah. this this story goes back a little bit. Uh, back in 1769. Oh, that's a lot bit. <laughs> that's a lot bit. <laughs> Lightning a hit a bit. church in northern Italy. Uh, so while this sort of thing happened occasionally to tall buildings, it still does, this time it resulted in a tremendous amount of damage as the church exploded. It just blew up, showering large stones of the church over a half a mile away, destroying much of the surrounding city, killing many hundreds of the townsfolk. The reason, the lightning rod, which had already been invented by Ben Franklin, hadn't made its way to the small town at the foot of the Alps yet. Uh, that and for some reason the church was storing a uh, hundred tons of gunpowder in the basement. <laughs> and then the lightning, kaboom. There's a Since combination then, of factors, yeah, yes. Yeah. That might have Since something to do with it. The importance of lightning rods to divert lightning strikes from buildings has become well adopted. In fact, this is this is considered the event that uh, worldwide got people's attention to Ben Franklin's invention. Uh, this is, lightning rods start going up very shortly after this, and places that hold uh, hazardous material and the like. And now nowadays we have them. Uh, everywhere they're incorporated, even if we don't see them. So this all make us, makes us safer from lightning strikes. Uh, unknown if churches are still stockpiling gunpowder. No, there's not been an update on that. 
<laughs> the Empire State Building is a lightning rod atop it, diverting some 25 strikes per year from itself and the surrounding buildings, transmitting all that energy safely uh, underground. <clears throat> On a mountain in northeastern Switzerland sits an 124-meter-tall telecommunications tower that is one of the most struck-by-lightning structures on the planet with over 100 strikes per year. Partly, this is due to being just closer to the action on top of this mountain, and then partly because of the size of the tower uh, acting as a lightning rod, the way it works is it attracts lightning strikes from an area twice as wide as the tower is tall. Hmm. It's sort of the basic lightning rod math on, on what uh, a lightning rod can protect. So it was the perfect location for Swiss and French researchers to test out their latest invention, a laser-guided lightning rod. Wow. So they used, uh, so this has been tried before, but lasers, as is, is much as we can maybe see them in the, in the night or on a sort of misty night, they tend to dissipate. So in this experiment, they used intense short laser pulses that were fired very close to the tower at a thousand times uh, greater rate than has been attempted before in, in similar experiments. And so they essentially were competing against the tower for the lightning strikes. So the laser pulses uh, are very intense and they, they're intense enough to ionize air molecules, creating narrow channels of ionization, laser pulses there over these is. long distance. This is that create a sort of ionized filaments in the air. The air mo oh gosh, hang on a second. I have no idea why Siri is popping in here to try to talk to me. Okay, the laser pulses are intense enough to ionize air molecules, creating narrow channels of ionizing laser pulses over long distances along these regions. Air molecules are rapidly heated by the absorbed laser energy and expelled radially at supersonic speed, leaving behind these long-lived channels of air that have reduced density. Reduced density air is the, the path that lightning travels when it's a downward strike. So these low channel the density channels, just millisecond in duration, have higher conductivity than the surrounding air, and therefore the lightning decides to go that way. So you can make your lightning rods way taller, basically. Yeah, so the idea yeah. is, and okay, great, we have these pictures up here. Now, in this experiment, you can see that it it caught the lightning, uh, and then it, it, it the lightning chooses the, the rod again later. And it's only grabbed it from about 50 meters. So it's not at yet at the point where you're talking about where you can have the lightning rod that goes all the way up to the atmosphere or something like this. This is a, this, but in this experiment, they proved that it's possible. They proved that it's possible to use a laser to, as a lightning rod, uh, to divert the path of, of lightning coming down. Also interesting is that there's a, a potential that they could use this to trigger lightning to, to actually do a discharge that mm. didn't naturally happen. So part of this is they're talking about, yes, we could use this to protect things like launch sites, sensitive installations, um, places that you'd be very afraid of having hit, be hit by lightning at certain times. Although if you're launching a rocket, you should be doing it during the day when there's a clear day without lightning strikes, but still. And see, these pictures that we've put up here, <laughs> the top ones you can see where it's kind of captured the lightning. And the ones at the bottom are ones, strikes that have happened without the laser on and where it just naturally hits that lightning. Rod. So you can kind of see the difference when it's doing the diversion. But the other thing that might be that, that, that just, if you can prompt a discharge, and I don't understand why this tower doesn't have some sort of energy generation, batteries, free spinning uh, kinetic wheel or something to capture this energy. It seems like you could just use it as an energy capture method <laughs> at some point. That's cool. Yeah. But then but then at some point you're like, oh, wait, we needed that electricity in the atmosphere because it's what's holding everything together. I don't know. But it's, <laughs> not gonna stay in, it's not staying in the atmosphere anyway because usually this energy yeah. is finding the easiest finding path to the ground, yeah. right? So this is mm -hmm. a way for the atmosphere to discharge into the ground. Now that said, 
there are potential reasons that it might be beneficial to have it go into the ground. Or, or it is a preemptive, you know, if, <clears throat> yeah. if you're if you're really worried that there's a big electrical storm is looming over a, <clears throat> a town or a facility or something like this, it might be yeah. a smart thing to do to discharge it with lasers uh, in a controlled environment versus having these lightning strikes hit all over the place. Uh, yeah. So anyway, this is published in the current edition of Nature Photonics online. They say there is uh, more research needed. I think so. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. But this is the this is the this is the first uh, proof of concept outside of a, a laboratory experiment uh, that actually successfully diverted lightning strikes from nature and with a laser. Pretty cool. cool. All right. So high intensity ionizing laser, short, high frequency bursts. Mm -hmm. Oh, and one important note that I left out. Yeah. They can control where these pulses are ionizing the air in such a way that they can they can get it to begin a kilometer away from the laser. Oh, whoa. Which then allows it to, you know, when it comes down, it can divert to a proper lightning rod as opposed to blowing up the laser every <laughs> like making it all the way back to the laser. So Don't they have a, back to the a power li yeah, source. A little yes. bit of control of where I suppose the, the wavelengths are building up for these pulses. That's cool. That is yeah. Grouchy Gamer. You know, shooting lasers into space. Do we really want to do that? Yeah, yeah we might attract a little attention now. <laughs> else we've in we've the been doing this, I think, so it's too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your planet was shooting at us when we flew by. Whoa, what's up with that? Oh, what's sorry. We're just having a light yeah. show. You know, yeah. it's a nice little rave. I remember one year at Burning Man, there were some NASA JPL dudes who had a big laser and they were encoding messages from people at Burning <laughs> Man that they sent out to Alpha Centauri. So cool. there, who knows what people messaged alpha centauri with on that yeah, night. It's, yeah. uh, they only know about burning man attendees that's interesting <laughs> <laughs> that's not too terrible i guess no, i don't know you could do worse what about it'd be much worse dogs? it'd be much, much dogs, worse Blair? they can get a hold of our internet Ooh. yeah really yeah. uh well dogs so if you enter a room with a dog in it are you compelled to interact with that dog i know i am not and more at all. specifically, I know you're not Justin. I knew I knew that. <laughs> more specifically, if there was a dog and there was a toy like under the couch or something, and you could see it, and they like were trying to get at it, would you would you grab that toy with your nice opposable thumb and hand it to that dog? Yes, yeah, yes, I would. Probably. Yep. Yeah, I would do it. Mm -hmm. So a sample group of children aged two to three years. We're twice as likely to help a dog reach a toy or treat when the animal showed interest than if it did not. So, Justin, you just proved that hypothesis, actually. Um, children were more likely to help the dogs get the out-of-reach items if they already lived with a pet dog. This definitely helps prime them to how dogs work, right? And if the dogs were livelier, so if they showed interest in the toy, or if the item was, in fact, a treat rather than mm. a toy. Seems like these toddlers are more keyed into the idea of feeding the dogs than retrieving a toy for them. So this uh, experiment was 97 toddlers, 51 girls, 46 boys, between 20 and 47 months. They were all from middle class families in and around the city of Ann Arbor, Michigan and surrounding towns. Um, so this definitely needs replicating. The majority of children were white. The rest were multiracial, black or African-American, Latino or Asian. 71% of them were white, though. So this is like mm -hmm. pretty Bias. skewed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait, um, why would there be a difference? I don't get it. Uh, it just culturally, right? If you especially if you are raised um, in a house with a dog versus not with a dog, like it's we don't know what's linked. Right. So or this is just a potential. Versus urban. Yes. Absolutely. Like when so I grew up out in the country and the way that I thought about animals growing up is not the way that people think about animals now. Like, 
you know, fur right. babies was not the thing out in the country. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, and not to mention and pets, very if different you have, type of animal. Yeah. If you have predominantly white researchers looking at predominantly white yeah. children, there can be skewing of results in observations. Yeah. So there's all sorts of things. Just basically you have to the, watch your variables, right? Yeah. So the thing that I think would skew the results the most is, is whether or not the dog had a flat snout or a big pointy one. Because well, you can that... see the three dogs right now. Yeah. Um, it is I would think Fiona, the one in the Henry, middle. and Seymour. Is Henry in the middle? <laughs> dogs. I don't know. If that's if it's the one in the middle, who's got a oh, long, Fiona. long I would nose, give everything I to bet Fiona. That one would be the most successful because partly, Fiona. partly, I think it's you know the the, the toddlers are recognizing the dog with its forward facing eyes or looking at an object. That's part of it. But the nose, if you've got a dog with a long nose, it's almost like they're pointing. But see, again, it depends Fair. what kind of dog they have at home. That's yes. what I'm saying. That's what if I'm they saying. Have I a, think if they have a dog dependent. If they have a pug at home, then they yeah. might respond better to see more. It's, it depends, right? It depends maybe. on experience maybe dependent. Like, yeah. If it's yeah. a pug, it's way. looking. If it's a pug, it's looking to the side and up at the same time. And this like, you might have no also idea be... what that dog wants why they picked these three dogs they but it also very might different. be why we should listen to the results of the study we <laughs> okay. determined... get to that i'm trying yeah, to make my um, gotten ahead there <laughs> so 44 of the children had dogs at home 53 did not the, the toddlers let's see this is oh this is between 2015 and 2020 this is a lot of results uh over kind of a long period of time um, the toddlers gave out of reach treats and toys in 50% of all events. Not great. However, um, they offered dogs objects they ignored only half as often on only 26% of occasions. So, uh, if the dog was specifically paying attention to the item, they were much more likely to hand it to them. So this, if this is independent of whether or not they have a dog at home, this particular metric, that means that toddlers can pick up on the body language that the dog is giving, saying, I want this thing that I can't get. Um, but then separately, having a dog at home mm -hmm. also had an impact on how good they were at grabbing things to the dog. But that makes sense because they're used to handing things to the dog at home. That's whenever yeah. I have a toddler over in my house, they, they just hand Sadie a toy over and over and she drops it. And they hand her a toy and she drops it. They hand her a toy and she drops oh, it. Oh, it's the perfect it's... play partner. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and then also this idea, the thing I thought was really interesting was that if the out of reach object was food rather than a toy, they were more likely to grab it. Now, this is interesting to me <laughs> because why? Is it because... The idea of eating something is universal from a very young, young age, or is it because humans are obsessed with feeding animals? Because this is a thing, right? Like if you offer, as a person who's worked with animals a lot, if you offer somebody the opportunity to feed an animal, doesn't matter how old they are, who they are, they get very excited. <laughs> <laughs> and I still yeah. get excited. I, I visited um, uh, a wildlife area recently and I was offered to feed a giraffe, which I have done literally hundreds of times, maybe thousands. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Is there something weirdly innately there about us wanting to feed things? I don't know. It's just very, hmm. it's a very question. interesting piece yeah. of this study. Obviously, future research needs to be done just to get a larger sample set, but also they want to look at the uh, psychological, psychological components of the interspecific instrumental helping. So is this something that, you know, happens across species? Is it just with dogs? Is it just with these items? Why, what if the dog needed to get somewhere? Would toddlers open a door for a dog? Like... Mm -hmm. What is the helping, right? Um, and then also looking at the underlying emotions that motivate them to help the dogs. And is this shaped by culture? Is this shaped by evolution? What is happening here? Why at such an early age do toddlers move to help a dog reach something that they can't get to? It's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think it is fascinating, especially, I think, especially when it's not your own dog especially yes. when it's not yeah. a dog in the toddler's household. I mean, there's the 
getting to know all of the individuals in the household as part of a social group and the reciprocity of helping and playing within your social group. But then when it's an animal outside of that group and you transfer that behavior to another animal, it's, right. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. That's why toddlers get bitten by dogs a lot. So <laughs> everyone be careful with your toddlers around strange dogs. Or family dogs, because most it's usually the family dog that does it, not some strange dog. But anyway, yeah. Why? When do we get around? Is it reciprocity? Is it, you know, as an adult? Yeah, I want to get close to that giraffe. Yes, I want to get close to that weird emu. Yeah. Yes, I want to get close to the rhinoceros. You know, to have them so close when you're, you know, not just throwing food a distance away, but that you're actually feeding them that means they're right. yeah. interacting with you yeah I, I and feel like lauren toddlers... in the chat is asking is it just empathy, empathy? which right. i need empathy. to know would a toddler do this for a rat would a toddler do this for a lizard this is what i yes. need to know is it uh, really yeah, just dogs like were we predisposed to do this is this why dogs domesticated us so easily <laughs> like... well that's what i was gonna say is i think i think essentially the the mindset of a toddler is a is not unlike any pack animal yeah they, they are they're running with their their pack you know they don't mm -hmm. yeah toddlers don't uh, fall down and then look for any uh human for help like they look for their their pack their they pack. try like oh you're yeah you're one of yeah so i don't know I, there's a little of that i also like wonder if this if there's any connection uh, to the thousands of years of animal husbandry mm. that uh, humans have been involved That's in. That's interesting, yeah. In terms of like wanting to, like you're saying, wanting to feed animals and take care of livestock. I mean, this is, if you ignore everything else in human history, this is how we've sustained ourselves for thousands of years, yeah. largely from agriculture and, and from animal husbandry. And I'm wondering if, if, you, if you were to run this test with... Uh, uh, peoples who didn't have dogs but were in, in a strict hunter-gatherer society, would they care at all? Right. Or would they be like the, the would they be like a you know a hunter farmer? I don't know. Seeing seeing as this is a as a competitive uh competitor uh in the environment and be like, I'm not gonna help that dog. That's uh, I might need that uh, treat later myself or whatever. I don't know. Well, that's the other thing. We need to do this experiment with chimps. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Get away from the human aspect and see Completely. the evolutionary yeah. control. Yeah. Do, well, no, the, the first of all, we have to figure out if a food. chimp would help. Yeah, if a chimp would even help another chimp. Uh, right. See, that's the. I guess bonobos. Let's go with bonobos. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's our You're best right. shot for anything. You're right. Anyway, Moving dogs, away, from, gotta love them. Go ahead. We do have to love them. Many people also love birds. Yes. And it's always interesting during bird migration season to find out that there are wandering vagrant birds in your local area. And if you're a bird watcher and you keep track of stuff, you know, people who are on the bird watching scene, they'll be like, oh my goodness, there's a broad tailed hummingbird in Portland. Broad tailed hummingbirds shouldn't be here. They're more southern. This is not where they should be, you know, why did they get here? And we think things like, oh, maybe these birds got pushed off course by winds, or maybe, you know, they got confused, but it's usually only one or two. And if you'd think if it were a real wind event, you would see lots of birds having moved from one place to another. So Researchers at UCLA uh, have published in scientific reports this last week their work looking into how geomagnetic fields might actually play into these vagrants. And their hypothesis and their evidence suggests it is disturbances in the geomagnetic field that often correlate with vagrants in different areas. And they actually have a website where they've got a lot of, um, they're doing a lot of predictions and they're looking at localized geomagnetic fields. Like we've talked before about uh, the shifting poles of 
Earth and how North and South are kind of shifting over time. And as part of that, there are like these weird outspurts, kind of like solar flares, but they're weird little outbursts that happen around the planet. And we're not predicting them very well, but what they've been able to do with their data is looking at 2 million captures of 152 land bird species in North America over 60 years. They have associated magnetic field disruption with vagrancy during fall migration. And it happens more so during fall migration than during spring migration, which is interesting in itself. Um, but they also have determined that that sunlight, so daylight migrants, are less affected by these magnetic fields. So it's the nighttime migrators that seem to be more affected by the shifts in the magnetic fields and these disturbances. And when they have put, put all these links together, all these bits of data together, they've determined that some, you know, it, it's a, a variation. Some birds are more affected than other birds by the geomagnetic effects. But, um, and solar activity can have impacts on it as well. But overall, they can predict an increase in bird vagrants, the wandering birds based on little blips in our magnetic mm. field. Yeah, so the birds are already migrating. That's already the yeah. thing. But then they get out there and the GPS is off. Right. Uh, they end up in the wrong spot. Yeah, what I think is really interesting in this is this is uh, mostly like fall migration. So older birds and younger birds are affected, but fall migration is like these are juvenile birds who have never migrated before. They're heading out and they're like, all I have is right. my magnet, you know? <laughs> and that's yeah, what... If I lose my GPS, <laughs> I can't just feel my way there. Yeah. And so the solar activity, the polarization of the light, the you know they're they're focusing on these cues that are probably very genetically ingrained, and they haven't learned all those little local cues of oh that tree's nice, that lake is nice, this is the path I go down. You know, whereas older birds will be like, dude, I'm just going to take shelter for the night. This is weird. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's true. My GPS that's, is that's out. Definitely... I got to find a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Better to spend the night than uh, fly for a whole night in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So anyway, um, they have a very interesting website that you can also access that is uh, is on hiatus for the winter time because nobody's really migrating but it is called the rare bird forecast and if you're interested in bird watching and kind of predicting whether or not there might be vag vagrancy or increased incidence of vagrancy they are linking geomagnetic activity and solar activity and making predictions as to the likelihood of whether or not you should be on the lookout for weird birds in your neighborhood and you can um, you can actually sign up for them to notify you when it's online. Hmm. If you are a bird watcher, this might be kind of cool. And then you can also help in the identifying of vagrants and the data collection and all the cool stuff that goes along with us trying to keep track of all these things. Yeah. Groove. Yeah. yeah. So um, now that we're done with birds, you want to talk about concrete? Yes, I have a very. <laughs> Big news from the world okay. of concrete. Okay. Uh, we may have finally figured out how to make it like the Romans did thousands of years ago. So despite all of the concrete that we've used in the last century, uh, it's we still don't really understand why it is that the Roman concrete structures have survived for thousands of years. Typically, modern steel reinforced concrete it's good for about 150 years. That's like maybe at the at the best. So uh, as long as it can avoid earthquakes and water making its way into the cracks or ice forming in those cracks, it can survive for about 150 years. We don't see a lot of major buildings collapsing or being demolished uh, be, because of expired concrete. That's mostly because we haven't been doing large scale building with concrete for 150 years. 
those, those days will soon be upon us as many iconic buildings will be reaching their expiration date Yikes. by the end of the century. So it may be much more common. It's like, all right, this year, hey, they're going to bring down the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building, that we might start losing some of these buildings because Yikes. they're built with modern concrete. Doesn't just doesn't stand the test of time. Meanwhile, the Parthenon, <laughs> the Colosseum, countless bathhouses and temples and even some Roman just houses are over 2,000 years old, standing still from Roman times. Previous attempts at recreating Roman concrete focused on one version of it, the chemical interactions of seawater with volcanic ash in the ancient admixture that adds structure to the cement that actually made it harder over time. Now researchers at MIT have discovered that hot mixing, which allows for a reaction of pure quicklime with water, which can produce a lot of heat, potentially it can cause an explosion. But by doing it this way, it allowed for a rougher admixture, which is very much like what was seen in Roman ancient Roman concrete. So it appears when you look at it almost as though it was it was poorly mixed because it's very granular and there's big chunks of this lime and calcium sort of stuck in there. And, and it looks like uh, they, you know, they went through all the trouble to make this uh, concise formula formulation. And then they just sort of half mixed it and, you know, did, did mixed it by hand as opposed to in a mixture. I mean, you know, and a lot of times it gets chalked up to like, well, the technology at the times, this is the only way they could do it. The clumpiness of lab-made concrete in this way contained a lot of calcium uh, and lime when exposed to water through the cracks, seeped out and made their way into the cracks and then sealed them up again. So they had they had uh, blocks that they made in more traditional formulas, formulations and some with this, this, uh, this hot uh, mix. And by the way, the hot mix didn't explode anything. They say it, it, it did heat up and there was a little bit of steam release of, of some sort, but it, it didn't explode. It was nowhere near that level. When they cracked the blocks and added water to them, the old formulation, they just stayed cracked. But in this formulation where they did it very much like the Romans did, they self-healed within two to three weeks. A self-healing construction material. Right, we've talked about this on the show exposed. before. It's like it's it's just there. It we it just it's been there for years, thousands of years. Thousands and it's of just, years. The question whenever, is, did they know what they were doing, or was this just the only way to do it at the time? Probably. So, so very likely they knew what they were doing. So, some of this, some of the the earlier the the. Uh, the knowledge that seawater was making some concrete stronger. They built piers into the sea that are still still there, which we can't do. We, we pour concrete into the water with the steel reinforcement and it breaks down over time. It has to get replaced. It gets into the steel and it rusts away. So they knew that there was obviously something going on here. And if you look at the recipes, the, the few that are out there, from ancient times, they're very specific that the lime, uh, quick lime, must be pure, completely white, without impurities. That the, you know, so they 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 had figured out their formulation. Now, it's the Romans, not the most inventive people. <laughs> not they really aren't. They are very good at implementation of things that other people have come up with. Very true. Like almost everything about the Roman Empire's technology is Greek. <laughs> almost all of the science they're using is Greek. From a, from a Elon time Musk. gone by, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so there, you know, you could question whether or not this had been discovered before or on some smaller scale. But in and once they find a useful thing, uh, sticking to it and recreating it, and so that's why also the researchers thought, ah, it's so weird that they have this sort of poorly mixed. It turns out it's actually what was required for the initial, uh, you know, for the chemical reactions to be taking place slowly over time and to create a self-healing construction material thousands of years ago. That's still there. Now, maybe not everybody used this. 
Maybe there's plenty of Roman structures that they were like, ah, why do we need to follow that specific recipe? I'll just mix the concrete, put it up. Those buildings have been long gone. Those right. buildings have been gone for 1900 years. <laughs> we don't know, it's dust they've been built on top of. But in using these formulas, especially for these large structures, they must have known that they needed this, this strength and this weatherproofing for something like a, a Colosseum or a Parthenon, right? So the big question now, because with concrete manufacture now, the big issue is carbon dioxide emissions. So as Rob Hagland is saying in the ch in the, our YouTube chat, uh, what are we doing, though? I mean, this is great self -he mm -hmm. self healing. It'll reduce mm -hmm. the amount of carbon of uh, mm -hmm. concrete that we have to produce over and over and yes. over again. But Correct. and that's it. And that, that's the and that's, that's the, the that's it. That's and that's the thing. If yeah. it. Okay. If you if if you can build it once, because it's the manufacturing process that's also causing a lot of this carbon, right? So you're adding more and adding more and adding more concrete where concrete already was placed, sidewalks, uh, infrastructure, all these things. If you can build it once and it stands the test of time, then you've reduced it, just right there. The carbon footprint of the the concrete, yeah. Yeah. But fingers crossed that they can also, you know, potentially work on this and reduce even the carbon dioxide output of this. I mean, this, Justin, I think you have brought these stories about Roman concrete to the show for the last couple of decades. Yeah. We're still not there. We're still not there. We're still this, not there. And th this so this is a like very a, exciting yeah. story. It really is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's something it was what is the I can't remember what it was. it was. It was some sort of fakeumentary where they pictured the future without humans. And I remember being really astounded by the fact that in like a hundred years time or so, all the buildings are gone. All the skyscrapers are gone. Like all these things that you would think, oh, in the future, people will look back on this great modern civilization of humans and say, oh, look at all the tall stuff they made. It's just dust. It all is going to turn to dust in 150 years or so. You know, so. Well, but that's only things made out of, not everything's made out of concrete, right? Because like the Yeah, the plastic you, will be lot. here. You're talking about Roman concrete, but yeah. if you go to Europe, there's a lot of structures that are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years old, right? And so what are they made out of? They're not made out of Roman concrete. Well, actually, of some of them are. Actually, are. a lot of them are. Yeah. Actually, no, no, that's the thing. That's the funny yeah. thing. When you the look at, when you go to dust. Paris and look at the old, and you, you, London, you're like, oh, look at these aqueducts. No, it's, it's still Roman, Roman concrete. concrete. Got it. It's, All right. If you're talking, but there is, but there's like, if you're talking hundreds of years, you know, you can make brick and mortar buildings that can last hundreds of years, but they're, those are also when, when a brick uh, breaks, you don't know how often these bricks are getting replaced. You don't know right. how often that, you know, maintenance can be done in small sections. When you're talking about a walls uh, of concrete, right. if those crack. And you, but I would say that's an argument yes. against concrete, right? Because having something that you can repair sectionally is more, has better. Yeah, but, 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 it, but then you're getting into a skyscraper <laughs> at some point, I think there's something to do with physics where like now yeah. there's a brick at the bottom that's taking the weight of the entire stru right. structure. Right. But uh, yeah, a lot of the ancient structures that you'll find in Syrian bathhouses and French, uh, ancient French temples or whatever, <clears throat> those are those are still Roman construction. That's what's so amazing about it. It's all across Europe. Mm. You can find these ancient Roman buildings that are thousands of years old. Speaking of carbon emissions, uh, there are organizations that are basically the leading ones for the carbon carbon offset industry, carbon taxes, so to say. Um, so one of the leading organizations is called Vera. Vera has been uh, is known for its position in the industry of 
being the leader in these projects in the Amazon and other places where they say, these trees that you put your money into, we're going to save them and it's going to be wonderful. Or we're going to buy this area and no more deforestation is going to happen. And all sorts of big corporations have bought into this stuff, um, at, like major organizations, Gucci, Salesforce, Force, BHP, Shells, EasyJet, Leon, and the band Pearl Jam. Huh. Um, have bought rainforest offsets that are approved by Vera for environmental claims. There has been a massive investigation by Guardian uh, journalists and the German weekly Die Zeit and Source Material. This is a nonprofit investigative journalism organization. And they have also been looking at new analyses of scientific studies of Vera's rainforest schemes to determine how good they are. Are they actually doing the work they say they're going to be doing? So um, the researchers have determined that, uh, no, it's all overstated. It's not uh, the Vera's rainforest carbon offset, offset schemes are not actually helping local economies. They're not helping the rainforest. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Vera, of course, is denying this and saying, no, 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 you didn't look at the right things. And the, 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 the comparative spaces were not the right comparisons. And there are other details because this is very complicated. And of course, it's complicated. But what the researchers have determined is that about 90% of Vera's rainforest offsets are useless, which when we're trying to figure out how we're going to deal economically with carbon moving forward as corporations say, oh, I've put my money into the rainforest and deforestation, so we're net neutral, right? And they can put stuff all over their labeling that says, zero carbon, net neutral, we're, you know, we're environmentally friendly. Maybe they're not. And so this is a, a huge issue. And, uh, and there are a couple of studies that have just come out in uh, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that are looking into various locations throughout the Amazon and how they're actually working to offset carbon emissions or not as the case may be so uh pearl jam gucci salesforce um class action suit please get your money back <laughs> and put it to good use yeah i mean it's there's one to uh learn from in this i think but this right, like right off the bat we're gonna plant trees in the rainforest how no, do you're, you're gonna prevent trees? them from being cut with, yeah, ah. prevent, yeah. I mean, ah. there We're going to do a thing by not doing a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, and you know, you can't win. Vera started doing their offsets. They didn't know Bolsonaro was going to be elected and push right. more deforestation, you know, and now the situation may switch politics. and, you know, the politics of an area affect various things of, as yeah. well as, you know, the localized politics of whether or not people are supporting forestation, deforestation, how they're going to work economically with farming or not farming or whatever they're doing. Yeah. Um, so then, or did so the then area you buy, to... was that already in uh, a, a, um, a protected forest? And but so you didn't do anything. But to Kiki's right. point, then you really do need to give them a chance under a, uh, a more helpful administration to take these things on before you judge it. For instance, uh, biofuel in the United States the corn mm -hmm. ethanol thing, whether you're for it or against it, it all but disappeared for three yes. years, four years under under the past administration. Yeah. Because they ended uh, subsidies. subsidies or not sub some, not so much subsidies, but it was it was a requirement that uh, regular fuel have this admixture of a certain percentage of biofuel added to it that then uh, paid for the biofuel industry, basically. Yeah. Uh, and and by eliminating that, the fossil fuel industry said, well, we don't need you or competition anyway, and we'll just not use you at all. And and it shut down uh, the that entire industry, basically, for for three years, four years. So 
So if there's a political, yeah, I can see if there's a real political thing involved in this in terms of you want to buy this land, but we're going to cut it down anyway, or we're going to cut everything around it, or yeah. There well, is a also need just... to do massive reforestation and nature protection. Yes. But to identify them as this is something we've offset, like I've offset uh, my carbon imprint by buying uh, a certain percentage of rainforest that is already existing, isn't an improvement in the situation. Yeah, it's exactly right. Throw, throwing we, money we at the grow... problem is is part of the issue as well, which we and then, talked about before. Yeah. Like, and then also, how many Pearl other people Jam bought that same piece of land with you? Their private jet, but instead, if they could but, fly commercial first class, that would reduce their carbon footprint, right? Uh, so there are things that you can do <laughs> that would help. That in actually that people have the power to do, but giving them the option to just throw yeah. money at it and say, I've done it. I'm carbon neutral is, yeah. is it's a, it's a cop out, unfortunately. Well, yeah, but I don't but want to discourage time, it too we, much, right? Right. But at the same time, we don't want it to become a situation where major corporations who do have massive influence globally stop do paying nothing. to avoid deforestation. Yeah. So who's in yeah. charge of making sure that's actually happening? Then? Me. Right. I nominate <laughs> you, me. You, you get to do make, it. I'll make sure it happens. I'll get it done. That's, yeah. There has to be consequences. That's the thing. This is why I'm saying that they need to be, if nothing else, they need to be sued. They need to feel it fiscally, right? So like yeah. there, there needs to be consequences so that people can't show up and say, I'm selling you a piece of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't sell the Eiffel Tower 50 times. That's exactly what this is, right? So It could be, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's the danger here is anybody can show up and say, I'm buying some trees in the Amazon for you. Yeah. I don't know regulated. that I don't know that that happened here, but that that is something that could take place. Where you, yeah, you're like the same piece. I was kind of joking, the same piece of land has been set aside for trees, and a million people have bought that two acres. Right. The hey Blair, you acres. know you d you didn't know it, but I bought you a target grade on the moon and named it after uh, you. That's what? great. That's so amazing. <laughs> um, so EasyJet so apparently, <laughs> yeah. The, but what's happened is. Um, in the meantime, there are corporations making changes. The fast food chain Leon no longer buys carbon offsets from one of the projects in the study. EasyJet is now working on new zero carbon emission aircraft technology. And so they've moved where they're actually putting their money. And this might actually be a better place to put it. So yeah. put it in the technology instead yeah. of mm -hmm. the mushy, squishy deforestation area, uh, carbon offset area. Um, and from this Guardian article, uh, Barbara Haya, the director of the Berkeley Carbon Trading Project, who's been researching carbon credits and trying to work in this area for over 20 years, her comment at the, at the end of this article is just on the nose, is that I started cut studying carbon offsets 20 years ago, studying problems with protocols and programs. Here I am, 20 years later, having the same conversation. We need an alternative process the offset market is broken. Yeah. So, of course, the offset companies are going to debate it, and this is a Wild <gasps> West kind of situation, but it's... Well, it, it's, it's also, a there's a huge amount of pressure from governments for it to work on paper anyway, because as we discussed so before, easy. they've already dedicated half of the world's agriculture, current agricultural land to the growing trees. two trillion trees in the next 30 years, but it built no infrastructure behind actually getting right. it done. Yeah. So along, I don't know along how with this, though, they're going to reach a get, goal that right, big we need to get, with we need this to, little effort. Yeah, we need to get working on this, however, yeah. because another study out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs has determined that with increased climate change and the intense storms that are going to be coming with more climate change, we will have what is called more wind throw. And that's when you have really big storms with lots of wind that come through and pick up trees and pull them out of the ground and throw them around. So the, the storms are going to be tossing the trees around. And so even if we have programs like Vera who want to have the carbon offset offsets in the Amazon, we're going to have these massive storms coming through that potentially are going to be uprooting all of those plants. 
And so this is an Uprooting. entire, I get it. <laughs> an entirely different area that needs to be uh, taken into advantage in uh, taken yes. into account in these carbon offset prediction models. Uh, Landsat 8 has examples of wind throw. They show these large, up to 1,200 acres, sometimes larger areas that have been blown down, just trees uprooted and knocked over and blown down. And then you have new growth that comes up afterwards. But of course, that new growth is not the same as those old growth rainforests. And so there's time for it to repair and recover. That is not going to be uh, adding to what we need from the rainforest as part of the lungs of the earth and part of the water process mm. of the earth and all the things that the rainforest is important for. So we got to take various things into account. I don't know. Electric cars. That's another story. They're going to be yeah. great batteries for our transition to an electric future. Your electric car in the, in the, in the garage, you're storing an energy in it. And if everybody's doing that, we've all got good batteries and that can be part of the grid. So anyway, there's positive stuff out there. It's not all negative. So it, all and, and it. in that too, it's like people have already started using uh, Tesla batteries. Now they have to get the wall, the thing that they've even taken out of the cars and you can install it in the home as a battery backup, as a storage for solar or whatever you've got going on. But yeah, being able to trickle charge those cars when there's a peak availability of electricity also do you do this in the homes you can charge homes that have these batteries over uh, they charge overnight when electricity is not in high demand so the mm -hmm. electric charge cost when they're using them later is less but that also means more efficient use of electricity we're already manufacturing with this, this whole story that you bring up what we need is a seat at the united nations for the nation of nature <laughs> right a a a a, a corporate and uh, a corporate nation that state is nature. <laughs> of nature with representatives who can be like, <clears throat> here's what we need. There's no seat at the table for any of this. And this yeah. is part of the problem is that it's being left to all. The, it's going to go in a corporate profit model. Right. If, if you, we if make you it a corporate profit model by which yeah. we attempt to rescue the planet from this. If you don't we put need... nature in the conversation as, as part the of the interested party, ecology yeah. equals economy yeah. conversation. Yeah. Separate the two. We need some voice of reason. Uh, I don't know. How do you start a country that's everywhere? <laughs> well, you have to have a GDP, right? Which what? nature has. You can <laughs> quantify it. Yeah. How do you start People the country that's it. already everywhere? Yeah. And claim that's the nation I represent. Yeah. The one that's everywhere. Anyway, we'll work on that one. We are going to work on all of this. I know all of you out there are going to be contemplating this for the next several days. But in the meantime, I hope you think about how much you love This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us. We still have a few more stories to go. But as we're sitting here for a moment, I would love to ask you to head over to twist.org and click on our Patreon link. And choose to support us $10 and more per month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. We really do appreciate your support. It is the thing that keeps us going. We can't do this without you. We love the science and we hope that you do too. Now we will move on to some other kinds of science that we like. It's the animal science. Oh my goodness, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. There we go. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? I have hot echidnas. Hot. They're hot. They're physically hot. Climate change is happening. Echidnas are heating up. They live on an island. What are they going to do? What do you do when you're hot? I like to... Just strut down the pool? boulevard knowing it. Yeah, okay, fair Go enough. Go for a pool, find myself yeah. some shade. You uh, you might sweat a little bit. Oh, I don't you like doing can't that. can't do that. Yeah. If you were a dog, you might pant. 
They can't do that either. <laughs> Echidnas can't pant, sweat, or lick. Also because they're covered in spines. Um, they but swim? they can't do any of those things to help with evaporative cooling in their body. And so it's been thought for a long time that they're pretty much just boned when it comes to climate change. They're in trouble. <laughs> so it's they have nowhere to go. They're on an island. They can't deal with the heat. What's going to happen? Well, some scientists took thermal video of echidnas in the wild. Uh, short-beaked echidnas in bush... In bush bushland in bushland which is about 170 kilometers southwest of perth and they wanted to see how these animals exchanged heat with their environment turns out they have some methods to cool themselves down in the heat which echidna biologists didn't previously know the they will actually um move their quills around which is really cool so their spines they when they're kind of tight to their body they they hold in heat they retain heat but when they kind of lose loosen them up it exposes the skin in between the individual spines if you look at a porcupine the quills are very very dense if you look at an echidna you can see skin <laughs> they're like they're they're more sparse and so they can open up their spines and they also can um, expose the spineless areas on, on their underside and on their legs. And that and can improve the ev evaporative cooling. It can improve uh, just kind of exposure to air that allows for a heat window. And that's heat exchange. And so that can cool them down. But what is more exciting is that they can actually blow bubbles from their nose. They blow them up so big they burst over their nose tip and wet the tip of their nose. And then as the moisture evaporates, it cools them down, cools their blood, makes um, so their nose tip works also as an evaporative window. So this uh, is a really wild thermoregulation technique, but specifically, this is actually um, conservation wise, this is important to know because it does mean that echidnas can be active under hotter conditions than previously thought. And so this can actually adjust predictions of how they will respond to a warming climate. Climate They're they're still not the best adapted for where things are going, but they're, they're going to hang in there better than previously thought. By blowing snot bubbles. Yeah. <laughs> Nature finds a way. It does. Love it. it Wow. So would we expect then that they would blow more snot bubbles, that they would need more water, that they would need... Right. Like, That's how will the trade-off. How will this affect their physiology if they have to be doing this to keep cool mm -hmm. more often? Right. So uh, that's exactly, that's the push pull, right? Is that every time they do that, they're losing moisture in their body. So mm -hmm. are they going to be able to get enough moisture to keep that up, to be able to continue doing that? Are they going to have to be active less during the day, during the heat of the day, because they have to go hide because it's just too darn hot? Um, it's There's still a lot of research that needs to be done, but this is a new factor in the, the echidna research and their response to climate change that uh, was not previously discovered. Echidna snot bubbles. Yeah, pretty cool. I actually want to see the snot bubbles. I think you can really? imagine it. Really? I, I do. What is, is it like a bubbly nose? Is it like... So does that mean my towel is trying to... Right. Could be. Trying to reduce his, his temperature yeah. with those snap bubbles? Oh, so. no. He has got he does excessive drooling. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No. That's his technique. That's just... There's teefers coming in. They're um, all in. They're all oh, in. Oh, jeez. He had... He has got like all... He got them so quick. And I don't, I don't know. I almost want him to be studied because I feel like it's. <laughs> you have too many teeth, child. There's more coming in. <laughs> Gotta watch out. Um, so speaking of climate change, um, 
Other ways that animals are in trouble from climate change, uh, they have to respond. And they have, and the way that many animals respond to climate change is they move to spaces that are more favorable to the conditions that they evolved in. And so um, for some animals, that's easy. For other animals, like those that live on islands, not so easy. And uh, so... There is actually a pending change in the U.S. Endangered Species Act by the Biden administration that would make it easier to relocate some of the most imperiled species to places where they're not previously been recorded. So an example of that is the Tristrems storm petrel, petrels, um, which is on northeastern Hawaii's Turn Island. It's six feet above sea level. No. Now. Yeah, so it's not long for this world. It's going to be gone oh, real yeah. soon. And so um, they are, researchers are looking at relocating 40 chicks to artificial burrows about 500 miles away on Oahu. So this would be a kind of a proof of concept to see if they could move these individuals, have them establish a home base there. And the goal would be that when they migrate away, they would return back to that new home when they were old enough to breed. And so that would mean that they could establish a functioning population in that space, recognizing they're going to lose all of the other ones on that other island. <laughs> so interesting. The whole issue here is what that... Was there already? Exactly. Um, so state wildlife officials and scientists have suggested moving some species struggling with climate change to areas that they might be well adapted. Specifically, Republicans in Western states, including Montana, New Mexico, and Arizona, are against the proposal, saying it could wreak ecological havoc as invasive species get purposefully introduced. Very interesting to hear Republicans worried about ecological havoc. But anyway... Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting conversation and it's it's nuanced because while on face value, that's true. You don't want to intentionally introduce non-native species to a space. That's like in a vacuum, right? But recognizing we have ruined everything already. <laughs> like nothing oh is God. as it should be. The yeah. the climate in the space where the animals are is not what they're supposed to be. The place you're moving them into is no longer suited for the animals that live there. So it's all a mess. So we're just trying to recoup what we can here. So if you can trust yeah. the ecologists and you can trust the people whose entire life work has been focusing on these ecosystems and studying them, yeah. we can make some ditch efforts to save species that are going away. As long as it is ecologically focused and not species right. focused. Right. And that is the thing that is really hard to figure out just yeah. by looking at this on face value. So yeah. again, you have to trust the, the, the institutions that are trying these things, which is a hard thing to do because... Who put cane toads in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> we did. Like, yeah. oh, yeah. So yeah. we're not always good at that systems thinking. So it's really yeah. hard to have that vote of confidence to be like, yeah, go for it. You know what you're doing. <laughs> but at the same time, do you let species disappear if you could save them if there is suitable hab habitat nearby and they just haven't been found there before? This is we, we were talking about this recently with Tuataras. Mm -hmm. That's so again, an animal that is almost extinct could go in a space. It is a space that is already messed up by other invasive species and yeah. climate change. So recognizing it's not a perfect system, can those in charge of these decisions make the right call to to save ecosystems and bring species in that are not going to upend other species? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we can't even do this with ourselves. So. No. <laughs> I, I just want to. I just want to point out on the political frame of this that uh, this situation is not unique. That they would uh, suddenly care about one aspect of the thing. <laughs> the people ignoring problems and arguing against the solutions 
is very much on brand. Yeah, you're right. Regardless <laughs> of where or how the, the subject is that is a, a, a before us, ignoring the problem, arguing against solutions, very on brand. Uh, and again, uh, another reason why we need a a community of just nature. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I think so. Hey, so I nature, think it's just, what do this you is think actually here? a very it's yeah. a very sad uh, but necessary component to mitigation. Uh, mitigation is a very sad but necessary component to the coming global warming uh, situation because because we're going to be needing to do this. Yeah, we're we're talking about some this one over, uh, species over, over, on this yeah. one island, but it's going to take place micro uh, biome by microbiome across the planet. That oh, these yeah. considerations are going to be needed, you know, anywhere from where trees grow now to, to where they used to. What what needs to live amongst those trees to survive needs to move. The yeah. things that they feed on, the things that feed on them. Everything needs to, and nature has always been able to do this seemingly seamlessly at oh. times and sometimes no, abruptly you know over what, Justin, really long time spans. You know what? Nature's going to do just fine. Things are going to survive, just not all the things. There's going right. to be a lot of things that die because they can't just keep yeah. up, you know. And We're in a mass changes. extinction. Yeah, it's a mass extinction. They happen all the time on this planet. You know, it's just going to be uh, another this is the day seventh. on Earth. This is the seventh. Yeah. Yeah, but, so so there'll be adaptive radiation after all this. The, the question is, the yeah, what what are what hand are we going to put it? So we have mm -hmm. had a hand in causing the extinctions. Can we have a hand in saving species and ecosystems? Yeah. Can or we? are we just going to make it worse? <laughs> yeah. And it, just to keep in to also that 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 later radiation and all this. A lot of these, these these bird species may have evolved over 23 million years to get to the point where they're well adapted to be on this island. You know, we're, we're talking about time scales of rebound that we must assume happen without us. That must happen after humans. After well, humans, but the problem is sea not... level rise isn't usually this fast. So, like, no, there'd be no. time for some of them to survive and get lost and be vagrants and show up somewhere yeah. else and establish yeah. a new population. But now it's just like, bam, your island's gone. Yeah. Well, so you know, if, and the question is, can the, with these species relocations, can we move enough individuals to get past population <clears throat> bottlenecks, would, right. which would themselves be a problem for that later radiation? Would we be moving enough individuals to make it any different from those random single vagrants who end up by themselves in the wrong place, right? Yeah. Right. Well, and and we're, once you move them to Oahu, yeah. are they going to be like, right. oh, snap, there's all this resort food, and they completely <laughs> change their entire, Absolutely. yeah, then, their entire Absolutely. habits. Yeah, and then, it's, you know, they're like, oh, the people died. Where'd the re resort food go? What? Huh. Well, there's, there are right now, there's, I think we discussed this on the show before, five island nations that are petitioning the United Nations for some sort of documentation or legal framework for them to continue to be nations once they no longer have soil. Yeah, virtual they want to They want to maintain the, their fishing rights for their waters. Wow. They want to maintain their voice in the world as a nation a state their of cultures. people what you do is you make a roman concrete <clears throat> island right there it is so we... just a build big a tower yeah and you keep adding to it yeah yeah oh man hey we're we're, we're joking but they they were talking about creating a flotation system in yeah. one of these nations i believe it the, like this is like it's it's not they were being forced to confront the thing that we almost jokingly uh flippantly say like oh that's gonna be tough to have a they're actually like yeah we need to figure out a way to keep our country well, on the planet on the maps yeah where are they going to be what are they going to do these are these are peoples right you water know. world yeah 
what's going to happen yeah. to Salt Lake City when it starts killing everybody with its arsenic clouds, right? And where they're not able to ship enough water through airships to replenish the Great Salt Lake. You know, there, there's all sorts of things going on. It's, you know, Cadillac Desert and Water World all over the place. Yeah. Okay, not to bring you all down, uh, but this <laughs> is This that. Week in Science, and we're really glad you're here. And, you know, the animals, they're very important to all the things. Yay, nature! Okay, so uh, we ask that you head over to twist.org, and if you would like a calendar, we are selling them as DIY PDF printables. You can click on the link on our website and get yourself a nice printable calendar for 2023. They're really, really wonderful art by Blair. And if you haven't done it yet, get yourself a calendar. It supports twists, and it's just really neat art to have on your walls. Justin, what stories do you have for us? All right, uh, real quick one here. Norwegian archaeologists have found the world's oldest runestone. 2,000-year-old sandstone inscription was recovered from an ancient burial ground northwest of Oslo. Apparently, it was either discovered or removed because there's a, a rail system coming through there. So they went through and did a, this big ex excavation. Found uh, something that's, they're dating to 2,000-ish years old. Predating the oldest currently known rune stone by a few hundred years. Carbon dating of bone and wood found in the grave beside the rune suggests it was inscribed between year one and maybe 250 A.D. These are often found at grave sites much later during the Viking era. Rune stones are stones that are exactly what they sound like. Stones inscribed with runic letters of the ancient Scandinavian alphabet. Uh, so far, though, the translation seems to be lost. Retranscribed into the Latin alphabet, the inscription is basically total Norwegian nonsense. <laughs> I-D-I-B-E-R-U-G. Ideberg? Maybe, hmm, maybe, which is apparently utterly meaningless, but also could have been a common name at the time. Nobody can be sure. Uh, being the earliest example of a written language in Scandinavian by hundreds of years, it is also the earliest form of a language that may not even translate well uh, to later runic writings. It so, could be slang or a swear. <laughs> it could be anything. <laughs> it could be any, they have no idea. It, the fact that it's a, a grave marker, yeah, you can maybe uh, jump to it's a name, but it it doesn't translate, uh, and they haven't they haven't, which is also fun, you know, especially if you if you are somebody who has been studying uh, runic writing. Now you have an older example, and it it's not fitting or it's not easy to transcribe. Now you have a mystery. They want to find more of these, of course, and they're going straight to display. It's going to be on display in the museum. Cultural History in Oslo from January 21st to February 26th this year. So people will be able to go take a look at it themselves. And, uh, and really encouraging news. Well, okay. I got to be careful how I set up a story. Really encouraging news, and then I'm reading. An estimated 90% of deaths from breast cancer are due to complications resulting from metastasis. It's okay, wait, so this is the just... process in which... Yeah, is that encouraging? What? Well, hang on. Let me. I got to get to the end yeah, of the story. Get to it. I, okay. So this is where cancer cells break down tissues from where they are formed, and then they travel through the blood or lymph circulatory systems, and they form tumors in other parts of the body. Breast cancer is always a race to remove cancer before this happens because there are not good options for therapy or curative. Uh, options once it is metastasized once it is these cancer cells are floating throughout the blood or lymph system so cancer cells use protrusions some say they look like little feet in invadopodia uh, to degrade the tissues that they then uh, quite on the allows nose. them to free up and travel to the other organs this is previous based on previous research at bar elon university of israel revealed two important clues about the formation of invadopodia, the level of two proteins, PYK2 and cortactin, suspiciously increase when the cell is entering this malignant phase ahead of metastasis. 
But if the cell lost its ability to produce one of them, PYK2, no metastasis was observed whatsoever. So in this recent study spanning on the previous findings, they discovered the mechanism which the, the protein interaction affects the formation and defined the structure of the complex between these two proteins. Researchers narrowed it down to a precise segment of the protein involved in the interaction between the PYK2 and the cortican, cortactin, excuse me. Small segment, peptides, was then synthesized in the laboratory and administered to breast cancer. It's, it's in the lungs and the mice, but it's the analog. Uh, Cancer-bearing mice. They synthesized this peptide successfully and with, with the place where it, it from the PYK2 and basically flooded the zone with this peptide. What happened was the other protein that the PYK2 was interacting with took up these just these little peptide portions and it stopped metastasis. The other pro it, it basically it ran interference. So got the one protein and the other protein and this one's like oh if i just had a little bit of what you got over here i could go and start the process of metastasis uh, down the road and instead it got these little segments that fulfilled its desire to connect but without the rest of the components needed to fulfill its its role so pretty amazing it wasn't 100 percent successful but it was a very high rate of reduction in metastasis so what they're doing now They've only used 19 of something like a thousand amino acid building blocks that were, that are in in this connection zone. So they're now focused on transforming this peptide into a, a better drug candidate. They're trying out different sequences of the amino acids. Uh, they're being uh, they're testing so they can get a very specific target of the binding site. Uh, also critical because the other binding sites that may be similar to this could cause side effects uh, in, a, in a drug if it were produced based off of this. So this is very, this is like the most encouraging. I know we're always talking about the, the, trying to avoid the cancer research down the road story, but this is the first one that I've really seen attack metastasis at a, a mechanism level. Which is that as opposed to just a, oh my gosh, we're going to... After the fact. After yeah. the yeah. fact. Of, yeah, yeah, we're going treatment, to give yeah. you treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. This let's, is, this is or attempt treatment because yeah. they're not successful, but they can be extremely invasive and extremely... I mean, this is when you right. get into full body chemotherapy, yeah. running chemotherapy drugs yeah. throughout your entire system to try to halt uh, the, the spread. Uh, this is the first one I've seen where it's like, okay... We actually can see now what we think is the mechanism that happens before metastasis. And we've developed a peptide that can be administered that can block that from happening. Now they just need to perfect it and get it into drug trials. And so this is five, seven years away, probably. That's great. But uh, meanwhile, everyone huge. learn how to do a self-check. Men oh. and women. It's not hard to do. They, you know, they never bring that up to men. I know. Like, like you, you, really you men don't get it as often, but it is. It yeah, they it's should. A problem. Yeah. 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 If we want I have, to I have, I have such little uh, muscle tissue on my body. I'm s such a rail that it would. I would. I would just look in the mirror and be like, "Oh, that didn't belong there." There's a like. I could see it. I wouldn't even need to feel for it. But uh, yeah. So I guess, yeah, I guess the next. Men too. Yeah, so the next big state of this is to move from mice and try and figure out whether or not they can actually stay in mice a little bit longer. Yeah, perfect it in perfect in the mice it. model. Yeah, uh, get that get that effect that they have seen. That when I say greatly reduced, they even aren't sure that metastasis happened right. afterwards. Uh, but they can they can tell that it was highly effective. Yeah. Uh, but now to perfect it so that it could be used in, in a large system without causing downstream effects and and to be more effective. So nice. really encouraging. This is this is one of the this is one of those things about cancer. That if this could be stopped, 
cancer wouldn't be as big a deal. I'm like, like really, would not be as big a deal. It wouldn't be as much of a stop. ticking clock. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you, you can get rid of the this? metastasis, that's the, yeah. that's the really big issue, right? It's when the it biggest spreads to game other systems in, and mm-hmm. starts, yeah. Localized, we can usually handle uh, when cancer appears in a local area. It can be simple as extraction. There's a bunch of therapies that can break down or inhibit tumor growth in a localized organ. That's a thing we can do now, today. This is the one thing that we haven't solved. This would be huge. So anyway, uh, this is a story to keep following. We'll hopefully, hopefully they'll. Yeah, I hope my seven years is way too far out. I hope they get <laughs> tremendous amounts of funding and excitement yeah. and parallel research is on board and and really move this forward quickly. Right, because it could affect more than just breast cancer. This is looking yeah, at just that metastasis <laughs> yeah. generally. Can we stop yeah. it from spreading? Yeah. yeah. Well, moving on from cancer and metastasis, I have a couple of stories related to epigenetics and aging. One of the things related to aging is you start getting achy joints, and part of achy joints is osteoarthritis related to your cartilage. So researchers have been trying to figure out whether or not we can use information gleaned from stem cells to be able to find factors that might lead to an understanding of how to turn back the clock on that cartilage. Because one of the things that we know about cartilage is that it just doesn't get the blood flow that other tissues do, and it's hard to repair. So if like your knees go and the cartilage in your knees go, you're like, oh, well, got to rebuild my knees. That's it. But what if we could have drugs or other uh, treatments that got got around surgery to enable the restructuring of old cartilage to make it work once again? So these researchers at USC just published their work in Aging Cell, and they were looking at a particular factors, one particularly called STAT. Three, it turns genes on and off. It's an epigenetic factor that regulates when aspects of cartilage cells are turned on or off. And uh, there's another molecule that's involved called DNA methyltransferase three. It interacts with STAT three. When STAT three gets inactivated, this DNA methyltransferase three gets really hyperactive and starts adding aging marks to the DNA, and that progresses osteoarthritis. So what they've determined from their work in mice is that if they could keep STAT3 activated, this could potentially keep cells thinking that they're younger or maybe even turn back the clock a little bit. So they did a bunch of experiments to see how they could upregulate STAT3 and kind of return it to a younger profile, and they found that they could which is really great because it suggests that, oh, hey, we can get some of these cartilage cells acting young again. But the bad news here is that even though we can control it epigenetically, these younger cells, the cells that kind of go, I'm young again, they don't know what to do with themselves because they are in an older tissue. And so because they are younger cells in an older tissue, they become potentially tumorigenic or they create weird tissue that doesn't match the rest of the tissue. And so it created a worse problem in the mice eventually. Ah, kids today. It's true everywhere you go. Yes. So it always has been. It always has been. So more to look at and you know, more to understand. And they've they've worked on aspects of this previously. So there have been other studies looking at rejuvenating cells related to Parkinson's disease and dopamine cell neurons. And, oh, you can't just put a young cell into the brain. You have to tell the cell what to do. So this is a starting point. And eventually they'll probably figure out other markers that will epigenetically allow them to control the re-education of these cartilage hmm. cells. So that they so, can be young again. So that's a very important thing that you bring up because a lot of the communication 
in tissues is between local cells. Yes. So why can't these young cells just listen? Well, they do, but they're not. It's like a grown up telling a toddler what to do. And a toddler's like, ah. Fine, I'll be kind of. Toddler's having a tantrum on the floor of Target. Right, exactly. (laughs) I'm going to do it for a little bit, but oh, I'm tired now. Or I don't really want to do that. I don't have an attention span like that. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So. I mean, this is this is also what cancer is. Cancer is cells that have stopped listening to the cells around them. They're they're ignoring the stop growing signals. Yeah, we're out of room. We're ignoring the apoptosis signals. They're they're ignoring the communication of from the other cells around them. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if somehow uh, this is, yeah, if they can just improve the listening ability, which is, I know, like a very ana- analog. Well, this we're doing a lot of. You need to make here. them younger, but, but not too young. Right. Yeah. Just a but little a, younger. Just a little younger, just so that you're not decrepit anymore. Or just maybe- make the whole body younger just do it all and so on that note there's another study out this last week that's been all over the news people have been excited about this uh this paper looking at epigenetics uh in mice researchers at harvard medical school have taken the yamanaka factors which are a series of of factors, OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, they're genes that are active in stem cells that are known to revert stem cells, revert cells. So you can add the Yamanaka, Yamanaka factors and other things to a skin cell and turn it back into a baby skin cell or a neuron into a baby neuron. And you take them back to these younger states, right? And so stem cells, the cells that can potentially are going to propagate and grow into the tissues they have they they're young and it's great and you you want to have as many nice young stem cells working in your body at all time to make sure that you're not aging too much so over time the stem cells themselves we've talked before about the telomeres at the ends of dna that start to shorten and so because the little aglets at the end of the 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 telomeres at the end of the DNA start to shorten, suddenly you start getting errors all over the place. And proteins are in the wrong places, and DNA that's supposed to be tied up is opened up, and DNA that's supposed to be opened up is tied up, and genes are getting expressed that shouldn't be expressed, and suddenly your skin is wrinkly. Suddenly you're getting older. Suddenly you have memory problems. Suddenly suddenly you're, you have osteoarthritis, and there are all these things happening. You're aging because oh. your DNA is breaking oh, down. Oh, no. Right. So uh, these researchers uh, have published their paper involving these older mice, and they had, uh, it was in Cell. And in this study, they took mice of the same genetic background, and they took some of them and had them have sped up DNA breakage. And they ended up with mice that were the same age but one mouse looked old and another mouse didn't, looked very young actually. And in this, uh, in what they've, in what they did, they also realized that they could then give the mice these Yamanaka, Yamanaka factors and they called them the ice mice. These ice mice had their vision, their glaucoma repaired, uh, their epigenome started becoming unscrambled, their tissues and organs returned to what could be considered more youthful states. And the lead author, David Sinclair, says it's like rebooting a malfunctioning computer. It set in motion an epigenetic program that led cells to restore the epigenetic information they had when they were young. It's a permanent reset. Wow. And Sinclair (laughs) has gone as far. And, you know, scientists can sometimes get really excited about their discoveries and really overstate stuff. And Sinclair's been on Twitter and he's like, this is, if it's correct, we're going to cure cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, you know, really it's the epigenome, DNA breaking. And if we can fix it and give it a reset, we can solve everything. 
My first With prediction a of the year. Treatment. <laughs> my first prediction of the year. Here it is. Longevity has been uh, solved. Reversing of aging. Just this year. Been- this, this I, I predicted yeah. this is this would happen. However, part of my prediction was that they would not tell anybody about it mm-hmm. because the ramifications of everybody living forever is really going to be bad for the planet. I think that's another issue there. And the economy there. Yeah. and society yeah. in general. Also, yeah. only some people will be able to afford it. So then... Only certain individuals then it wouldn't will be get so to bad. live forever. Then it, then it wouldn't be so bad. Except if you think about the people that will be able to afford it, that's... That's not what you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's what they want. It's not what we want. Um, well, I'm going to be friends with those people then because then maybe if I do their bidding right. long yeah. enough, they'll keep me around a little longer. Can you imagine that though as like a as a as a perk for for a for a job? Also, this will give you access to longevity. For yes, our benefits years. package include an extra thirty years. Oh, geez. You'll <laughs> yeah. just be working for. Well, you'll be years? working for us yeah. the entire because time. You're mind young. Yeah. You're so you Who can needs retirement? Yeah. Yeah. It'll be every five years. You will get another five years. It's not a retirement package. It's a reworking package. Oh my god! Mm, forever working package. <laughs> I think I'd rather oh. die. <laughs> yeah, there's a limit to the amount of. Depends on what you're doing. If you love what you're doing, then I mean, I can do this show forever. Well, you don't do this, this for 40 different. hours a week. <laughs> it yet, is different. Yet. But yeah. in the new benefits program, it will be required. <laughs> yeah, so there is another study as well, also not yet uh, peer-reviewed. The the cell studies peer-reviewed. They, they did this work. We're able to somewhat repair aging in these mice. Um, there's another paper out in bio, bio archive, the preprint server by a number of researchers called gene therapy mediated partial reprogramming extends lifespan and reverses age related changes in aged mice in which they uh, essentially were able to allow an age equ- equivalent of 77 year old mice to live longer. Um, so same gene ther- therapy, the Yamanaka factors, uh, system- systemically delivered AAVs, which are adeno, um, adenoviruses encoding inducible, inducible Yamanaka factors, extended the lifespan by 9% in mice. And, the, and in human skin cells, they observed significant epigenetic markers of age reversal potential to a healthier state. So the question is, is this work the kind of work that can be turned into a treatment that can help skin cancer? Is this the kind of thing that can help glaucoma? Is it the kind of thing that without surgery, we can you know, help with age-related disorders like Alzheimer's and, and others that are very complex disorders? But yeah, uh, it's there are like you mentioned, Justin. There are economic and other social concerns as we look at the extension of and, life. Yeah, and aging. does it affect everything? I mean, if I'm a if I am now a young man in my twenties in terms of vim and vigor, which also tells you my age. What I'm saying, <laughs> you're seventy eight. Yeah, and yet I still have. Uh, Horrible arthritis and uh, Alzheimer's is still catching up to me. And like, like, is it going to affect everything? Hey, if it gets rid of the wrinkles and I look great, but still have a bad back. I don't know, you know, how much of this, how much of the, this uh, rejuvenation is outward facing and how much of it is actual internal health changes, Uh, uh, you know, more is better. Right, but and, and con- like simil- considering the effects of the younger cells in the osteoarthritis situation, mm-hmm. how much of it is actually going to be beneficial? Like, yeah. are there deleterious effects on the body system by reprogramming cells and making them think they're younger? If I'm like here how, when I'm 77, I will take that. It? I'll take that. <laughs> Right. Will you? Will I'll you? take yeah. it. My I'm, ligaments I'm, I'm, are great, but you. my bones have turned to dust. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's dusty old science, people. I think we've come to the end of another episode. Have we done that? I think so. Certainly. 
Certainly. We made it through. Thanks, everyone, for listening to another episode of This Week in Science. I would love to say thank you. Shout outs to a number of people. Identity 4, workaholic out there. Thank you for recording the show. Fada, thank you for your help on social media and the show descriptions that you are so helpful with week after week. Gord, Arnlore, others who help with our chat rooms and making sure they're nice places to be. Thank you for all your time in there. And Rachel, thank you for editing the show. And of course, as always, I do want to especially thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schofer, Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vigard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Reagan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S. 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Jet Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Jay Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric, yeah, Eric, 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 Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthan, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And for anyone out there who is interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while you work out your bones and muscles and cartilage so you can live forever? Just search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories will be available via our Website, www.twist.org, where you can also sign up for a newsletter. You can also contact us directly. Email Kiki at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at Gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered to an island that is about to be underwater. No! Oh. <laughs> Uh, you can also, in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the. Oh, listen up, everybody. It's the after show. <gasps> Just we are joined by our guest, uh, Mr. Felix. Hello, Sorry. Mr. Felix. Somebody's almost ready to read show notes. 
I heard him chiming in. He said, oh, what? Yeah. Very much talk for the science. Talk He's for like, science. talk about the haikus well. that come to you in the night. <laughs> <laughs> Little baby haikus. I would like to see them all. Felix says, I will touch your keyboard. I'm going to make all the things happen. Oh, yeah. He's very much into, <laughs> into technology. Yeah. What kid isn't? Jeez. It's so stimulating. So we're going to bounce. We're going to go. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go grab some breakfast. Good. Yeah. Got go feed the babies. I'm going to bounce onto my mattress then. <laughs> you can do that as well. Oh, uh, should I already say it? You guys want to talk about any after show, or you could do it? Uh, if I'm not here. There's no after show. Is that what happens? No, I mean, unless we have something really that we need to talk about. But I mean, seriously, I would love to stay for an after show. But I mean, if you're going, we can all go, and that's okay. Yeah, it's all right. I think we, it's very exciting that we got to see a, see Felix this morning. Yeah. So. Yeah. That is great. Can you see them? Can you say hi? Can hi, say hi, hi, Felix. Hi, hi. Felix. Hi. hi. Yeah. He can't hear us, though, right? No. No. No, he probably can't hear you. That's right. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm waving. Hi, Felix. Hi, Felix. Hi, Felix. Hi. Hello. Hello, Felix. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> He's like, oh, uh, what is happening I'm here? Confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's just waking up. Go so, uh, uh, go ahead and say then, uh, say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good morning, Justin. Good morning, Justin. Good, good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone, and good morning, Felix. I hope everyone has a wonderful day slash night slash week. All the things that you're doing. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We'll be back again next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time. Let us know if there's anything in the meantime you want us to know us want us to know about. But uh, we'll be back. Don't eat wild fish. Thank you for your time. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay curious. <laughs> Jeez, right. I love how you're always searching for the. That Classic. final word. Uh, stay curious. Don't eat uh, wild fish. Uh, don't <laughs> run with scissors. Remember not to run with scissors, everybody. That's right. I got the things. <laughs> no teach <laughs> man eat fish. He day. Uh, don't, don't, don't <laughs> cook your eggs. This is. <sighs> I like my stapler. Okay. <laughs> Everyone have a wonderful week. We'll see you again next Wednesday. Good night, Morgan.